Your initial physical examination should involve a detailed neurological examination, including mental status, orientation, and level of consciousness, cognition, including memory, balance and coordination, strength and sensation of the extremities, evaluation for scalp skull abnormalities such as hematoma, tenderness, or depression, and for cervical spine tenderness injury, and any signs of neurologic deterioration. Evaluation for signs of neurologic deterioration is critical to help rule out the presence of intracranial injury. Signs of neurologic deterioration include indications of cervical spine injury, any focal neurological deficit, or decreasing level of consciousness and severe or worsening symptoms. Other important signs include any loss of consciousness greater than 30 seconds, increasing headaches, repeated vomiting, slurred speech, increasing confusion, unusual behavior, irritability, seizures, weakness or numbness in the upper or lower extremities, significant cervical pain with tenderness and or loss of range of motion, any suspicion of neurological deterioration or persistent focal neurological deficit should prompt emergency evaluation and consideration for hospital admission. Other indications that may prompt admission of a patient include any signs of intracranial injury that require monitoring and repeat neurological exams, fluctuating or deteriorating neurological, cognitive, or symptom evaluation. The safety of the patient is better served by careful neurological observation than by home observation. It is unclear whether the patient can be adequately observed for signs of deteriorating neurological function if sent home or to an unsupervised situation, severe symptoms that render the patient unable to tolerate oral intake or ambulate safely. Healthcare providers should not routinely image a pediatric patient with suspected MTBI for diagnostic purposes. This includes the use of CT, MRI, SPECT, and skull X-ray. Instead, healthcare providers should use validated clinical decision rules to determine if imaging is warranted. Validated decision rules combine a variety of factors, which might indicate higher risk of intracranial injury, such as age is less than two years old, vomiting, loss of consciousness, severe injury, severe or worsening headache, amnesia, non-frontal scalp hematoma, Glasgow Coma Score less than 15, clinical suspicion for skull fracture. As part of the decision-making process, be sure to discuss the risks of pediatric imaging in the context of risk factors for intracranial injury with your patient and their parents. It is important to note that children with suspected intentional trauma, other intracranial abnormalities, specific genetic, metabolic, or endocrine issues, and bleeding disorders may be at higher risk for injury and should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Following your initial exam and evaluation for more serious injury, you should assess your patient using the following criteria. Characteristics of injury, symptom type and severity, risk factors for prolonged recovery. We will now take an in-depth look at these criteria. Knowing exactly how the injury occurred in as much detail as possible is helpful when proceeding with diagnostic tools and treatment options. Do so by following these steps. First, ask how the injury happened. Different biomechanics may result in varied symptoms, and it's helpful to understand the type of force and location where the force was received. Second, document the type and location of force. The magnitude of that force may dictate how much damage may be occurring inside the brain tissue. Remember, a relatively minor force can also lead to significant symptoms in children who may have increased vulnerability to MTBI. This includes children who may have other physical or psychological factors that exacerbate their symptoms. Rotational force is also a factor. 
Studies show the magnitude of rotational force may cause an MTBI and increase its severity. Children with MTBI commonly present with one or more signs or symptoms that generally fall into four categories. It is important to keep in mind that these categories are not mutually exclusive. The first category includes somatic symptoms. Second includes a category of cognitive symptoms. The third category includes mood or affective symptoms. And the fourth category is related to sleep. Take a moment to explore the symptoms in each category after the training by accessing the resource center. Importantly, MTBI symptoms may look different in children of different ages. This is especially true among pre-verbal children or children not in school. For example, a toddler may manifest any of these symptoms through irritability, clinginess, and poor appetite because he or she cannot express what is wrong. Likewise, it may take additional probing to detect inability to focus in a child not yet in school. Diagnosing an MTBI can be challenging as symptoms overlap with those of other medical conditions, such as depression, dehydration, pain, and headache syndromes. Over the last decade, growing research has led to a better diagnostic approach for MTBI that moves away from a classification system using mild, moderate, and severe MTBI to using an age-appropriate, validated symptom rating scale. Examples of validated assessment tools include, but aren't limited to, the Graded Symptom Checklist, Post-Concussion Symptom Scale, Health and Behavior Inventory, Acute Concussion Evaluation, or ACE. Assessment tools should not be used as the sole diagnostic criteria for evaluation in children presenting with acute MTBI. Take a moment to explore these tools and others after the training by accessing the Resource Center. Through this assessment, record your patient's symptoms and severity level. Pay close attention to changes in the child's baseline. Since symptoms like headache might be present prior to the injury, it is important to assess any changes from usual symptom presentation. Computer-based tools are also commonly used to assess for MTBI. Evidence suggests that validated, age-appropriate computerized cognitive testing may be a helpful component of diagnosis of MTBI during the acute period. Importantly, there are varying levels of research and evidence on the different computerized testing tools available publicly. Healthcare providers can more effectively counsel patients with MTBI when they have assessed risk factors for outcome and recovery. The risk for prolonged recovery is determined by a number of factors. The first factor that increases the risk for prolonged recovery is initial symptom burden. Recording symptom presentation and severity can help assess for progress in symptom resolution during management. The second factor that influences risk for prolonged recovery is history of MTBI or intracranial injury. When possible, ask about the mechanisms of prior brain injuries and the duration of symptoms. The effects of multiple MTBIs may be cumulative, especially if there's little time between injuries. The third factor is personal characteristics and personal and family medical history. The CDC guideline identifies the following as showing an association with prolonged recovery. These include older age, such as an older child or adolescent, female sex, Hispanic ethnicity, lower socioeconomic status, lower cognitive ability, neurological or psychiatric disorder, such as depression, learning difficulties, increased pre-injury symptoms, such as headaches, family, and social stressors. Healthcare providers may assess the social supports already present in the child's life, including people who provide emotional support, problem-solving advice, constructive feedback, and positive affirmations. Emphasize social support as a key element of recovery when educating families and school professionals who will be interacting with the patient during recovery. Tracking recovery over time is another key role for healthcare providers managing children with MTBI. There is no single assessment tool to track recovery. Instead, 
healthcare providers should use a combination of tools. These tools may include validated symptom scales, cognitive testing tools that measure reaction time, and cognitive testing tools that measure balance testing. MTBIs can happen both on and off the sports field. However, there are special protocols recommended for sports-related MTBIs. For this reason, we will take some time to focus on on-field response and diagnosis of sports-related MTBI. If you're a healthcare provider covering a sporting event, you should be prepared for any injury, including an MTBI. Make sure you have a game day emergency medical action plan in place. This plan should address, but is not limited to, hydration, weather, cervical spine injury, MTBI, and other more severe brain injury. When developing an MTBI plan, you should incorporate four individual components. One, pre-season planning. Two, on-field exam. Three, sideline evaluation. And four, removal from play. We will discuss pre-season planning in Lesson 4 when we talk about prevention of MTBI. So let's jump to the on-field exam. The on-field exam should be systematic and include three components. First, the ABCs. This includes assessing for adequate A, airway, B, breathing, and C, circulation. Next, neurological assessment. Here, there is an emphasis on mental status neurological deficit, and cervical spine status. And for potential cervical spine injury, the cervical spine should be immobilized and emergency transportation should occur. Last, you should determine initial disposition, either emergency transport or sideline evaluation. In a sideline evaluation, you should perform a more detailed physical examination and history, including discussion of any previous MTBIs if possible. You will need to assess for MTBI symptoms. You can use a sideline tool or checklist to assess for symptoms of acute MTBI. One commonly used sideline evaluation tool is the SCAT, or the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. This tool was developed for use only by healthcare providers. It has been validated and includes a version for children. When assessing for symptoms, pay attention both to the number and severity of symptoms. Researchers now believe children with more severe acute presentation of MTBI symptoms are at increased risk for a prolonged recovery. Next, evaluate the athlete's orientation, memory, concentration, and balance. An athlete should be removed from play if he or she exhibits MTBI symptoms following a hit to the head or body. That includes incorrectly answering memory or concentration exams or has problems with balance. Once an MTBI is suspected, the first rule of thumb is no same day return to play. This rule is consistent across all sports. Don't let others pressure you or the injured athlete to continue playing. Some athletes may try telling you, I'm just fine, or I can tough it out or shake it off. Inform them that taking time out is not a sign of weakness, that playing with an MTBI is dangerous and can put him or her at risk for serious injury, long-term disability, and even death. You may get resistance from parents or coaches and need to advocate for the safety of your patient. Monitor athletes with a suspected MTBI until they show a steady improvement or resolution of symptoms. It may take 20 to 30 minutes for indications of a more serious injury, such as a subdural hematoma, to appear. If they do not continue to improve, refer for same-day evaluation by the athlete's healthcare provider. If the athlete is able to be sent home, he or she should continue to be observed for 24 to 48 hours for signs of deteriorating neurological function. The child should be immediately transported to emergency care if signs of deteriorating neurological function or worsening symptoms appear. Remind parents observing a child at home that they do not need to wake them during the night or when napping to assess for symptoms. 
You can use CDC's Fact Sheet for Parents or similar materials to review the symptoms parents should watch for at home, as well as the symptoms they should watch for when their child returns to school. After an injury occurs, it's important for you to remember to reinforce MTBI safety with coaches, parents, and athletes. You should also include league and school officials when appropriate.